This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Welcome to this Razor COVID-19 special. I'm Emma Keeling. Keeping track of SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, is essential to limiting our exposure to it. Nextrain was created by an international group of scientists using software that uses the virus's genetic material to trace its spread in real time. It's been praised by Bill Gates and won the Open Science Award. I spoke to Nextrain co-developer Dr Emma Hodcroft and asked her what they are looking for. So what we do is we take the genetic material and we look for tiny changes in between one sample and another sample. Now these are mutations, but they don't tend to be what people think when we say mutation. They usually don't change the function of the virus at all. They're more like typos in a document. But you can imagine that if you have something with a couple of typos, you can still read it perfectly fine. So it's the same for the virus. But what we can do with these changes is they show us what viruses are more similar and which ones are more distant. So if we see viruses that share the same mutations, we put them close together. And if we see viruses with different mutations, we put them further apart. And in this way, we actually create what's like a virus family tree that shows us how all of the samples are related to each other. And then, because we know when and where these samples were taken, we can infer what might have happened in the past. And this helps us track the virus as it moves around the world and through time. Why is it so important to have this real-time snapshot of a virus? So this has been really informative for helping us see how the pandemic is progressing day to day. One of the most important things we've been able to show with genetics is to differentiate imported cases and then local transmission. If we have, for example, five cases one day in a country, just from testing alone, we wouldn't know, are these people people who'd been to somewhere high risk and then come back, or did they all catch it right here? With genetics, if they've come from different places and caught the virus somewhere else, we would expect those samples to be spread out on the tree. But if they've caught them all in the same place through local transmission, they'll bunch together really closely. And this is really important for informing us what interventions we should be focusing on. Is this something that we should be stopping from being imported, or do we need to concentrate on social distancing right here to stop local transmission? So is anybody using the data that you're coming up with? Yes, so I definitely think now that people are, um, and I think that this was really shown quite clearly with an example from Seattle, Washington, that has been has been told a few times. But what happened there is there was a Seattle flu study that was collecting swabs for flu surveillance. So this is a really normal thing. You send swabs out to people at home, and then if they feel a runny nose or a cough, they swab themselves and they can send the sample in. And we use this to just better understand how is flu moving around from season to season. What was really great this year was that people in the Seattle flu study had the idea that we should be testing these swabs, not just for flu, but for coronavirus as well. This was when the CDC guidelines were really strict. So no one was being tested for coronavirus unless they'd been to an at-risk country. But these swabs were coming in from normal people in Seattle. When they started testing, they found that yes, they did have positive samples in the Seattle area. Where genetics came in really useful was that we were able to show exactly what I said earlier, where these sequences grouped really closely together, and therefore they were an indication of local transmission in Seattle at a time when it wasn't known that this was something that was happening in the States. So we're really happy that the Seattle flu study was operating somewhere and in touch with people that work with Nextrain so that we could help raise this alarm that local transmission was happening in America. Where did this idea come from? I mean. You was it just, did something happen and you thought, hmm, maybe we should create this amazing thing? So Next Train was originally started at the end of 2014, beginning of 2015. And this was originally started as Next Flu. And the idea was to track flu as it moves around the world from season to season so that we can better see how it changes and what strains might be coming around this year. This is still a big part of what we do at Next Strain. Now, as it grew as an idea and as sequencing became more available for other pathogens, obviously the name had to change to something a bit less flu specific. So we changed to Next 
X-Strain. And since then, we've been able to use the same techniques and improve them for things like Zika, Ebola, measles, mumps, and enteroviruses. So it was actually really um, natural for us to pivot to the new coronavirus when reports started coming in in January and the first sequences became available. So this will be great because we're hearing about the second and third waves of this virus. So what you've learned from the first wave can be applied to help maybe reduce the amount of infections in the second and third waves. That's definitely what we're hoping. And we're also hoping that we can get insights, for example, into what role different cities in a country might be playing, or even what role demographics might be playing. What role do children play in infecting older people? Or is this something that we don't really need to worry about children as being a transmission vector? These are all things that genetic information can give us insight into. And so we're really hopeful that the number of sequences will continue to go up so that we can help do these detailed analyses for countries and help guide their public policy. The UK government has only recently reintroduced the, the contact tracing. Um, I mean, how important do you think that, that wider tracking and tracing is with COVID-19? So I think this is really important. I'm a very strong advocate for what we call test, trace and isolate, where the idea is that we do lots of testing and then we do contact tracing for everyone who tests positive and we isolate both the infected person and any of their contacts until we can confirm the contacts are negative. The big thing here is that we often talk about coronavirus as an invisible enemy or that we're fighting an invisible war. Testing is what it takes to see this invisible enemy. It makes this invisible enemy visible. In similar research to that of Next Strain, Dr. Peter Forster and his team have used 160 early samples of the SARS-CoV-2 genome to visualize how the virus has evolved as it spreads. Their research has shown that the virus may be a little older than was originally thought and now exists as three distinct strains, A, B and C. Because we have now in our study unraveled the viral tree with the A, B and C types, we can now do something very neat. We can apply the mutation rate of the virus like a clock to our tree and calculate when the outbreak occurred. And doing this, we find that the first infection, possibly from a bat to a human, happened no earlier than the 13th of September 2019 and no later than the 7th of December 2019. What you do need is to take all the early samples, as we've done, all the 160 samples, and then calculate with the mutation rate when it all started and what is the original type, which is, as we're certain, A. Finding which strain is the earliest requires additional samples. You need something which is non-human, so what do you take? You take the bat coronavirus, because that's very closely related to us. And if you apply that location in the network, which we call type A, is the original type that would have infected humans. And uh, then it would mutated and change into a type B. This type B was then the first genome to be picked up in Wuhan when the disease became apparent. And so researchers might be forgiven for thinking at the time that B is the original type, um, but actually it's, it's not. It's type A, which in Wuhan is only a minority type, but B has become the majority type during the outbreak and that is mutated further into C. Now, the C type is not found in the early phase of the outbreak in mainland China. It is found outside. For example, it's well represented in Singapore.
every story starts out like this. Beyond the rush of the numbers, there's always a more fundamental question. What happened? Who has been affected? When market moving decisions are made, who's responsible and why? Let's get some reaction on ground. Joining us in Johannesburg is Sutra Hello, Naro. This well, is how all stories begin. See how they end. Only on Global Business. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought about unprecedented collaboration from research institutes and scientists from all over the world. In the UK, the Diamond Light Source Synchrotron facility is applying their knowledge and expertise to understand the structure of the virus and assist with drug discovery. Shini Samara with this report. A synchrotron works like a giant microscope, harnessing the power of electrons to produce bright light and X-rays that can be used to study the atomic structure of anything from fossils to jet engines, viruses and vaccines. With the current pandemic, staff and working hours have been scaled back, but the remaining workers' full attention is on COVID-19. So essentially what we're doing is we're looking at the, the I suppose the molecular machines, the small components of the virus that are actually there to make the virus work. So this is all very easy to do at the synchrotron because of the techniques that we're able to exploit to uh, understand what these things look like at the molecular level. So the synchrotron is a microscope, it's a big microscope that is able to look at these molecules that are tiny. So the microscope works is it's just a big light bulb. Essentially what it is when you turn it on is you generate x-rays. It's not visible to our eyes because it's x-rays, but you generate these x-rays that are highly, highly intense. So it's about a thousand times more intense than the sun. And you just turn this light bulb with very intense x-rays and you probe matter. You throw these x-rays, for example, at proteins, biological samples, and that's essentially, in a nutshell, what the synchrotron is. But proteins are the machines that allow life to exist. We're able to make a strong relationship between the shape and the function. We now know that if we understand the shape of one of these machines, or one of these proteins, we have 50% of the way to understand how it works. And if we get a snapshot, a picture of that machine in different positions, then we can 100% of the understanding of that machine. You know, the analogy is, if you look at the hinges of a door and you watch the door open and close, you'll understand how a door works. One of the main tools used for understanding the structure of the virus is X-ray crystallography. Nearly 600 samples of COVID-19 are stored in liquid nitrogen. A cold gas nozzle keeps the sample at a low temperature so it can't degrade. 3,600 X-ray diffraction images are collected as it rotates in the X-ray beam. Using these images, a 3D structure of the proteins can be determined. And what kind of scale are we talking about? We're not looking at the virus in its entirety. In a sense, we're looking at the individual components of the virus, which are essential for it to be able to replicate and infect and cause disease. That also kind of applies to trying to identify potential antigen for uh, vaccine development as well. And so if we know what the protein looks like, then we can understand uh, how it functions and how it carries out that function. So if we can understand how it functions, then we can also work out how to stop it from functioning. By studying the protein structures of the virus, they've worked out which ones have an important role in its life cycle that can be disrupted. They're concentrating on a protease, an enzyme that's essential for viral replication and therefore part of the virus that could be successfully targeted for drug discovery. The next step is screening chemical compounds to bind to the specific protein, which can be used to build upon by chemists to design drugs that can disrupt the virus from working. 
In the past four six weeks, we screened over um, 1,500 different compounds. And from that first uh, tranche of uh, screening, we found about 90 different compounds that are uh, bound to the, uh, to the protease in this case. And we've released all that data so people across the world can access that data and uh, they can see what the data is. And this has accelerated uh, development of better compounds to actually test. So I think we've essentially got this uh, crowdsourcing uh, collaboration now, which is called uh, COVID Moonshot. And there's been over 300 uh, chemists around the world that have contributed to this uh, crowdsourcing initiative. And they've actually looked at all the data that we've collected at Diamond, and they've uh, suggested or come up with new compounds or what compounds they think would uh, be able to bind better. This is really very, very new because this hasn't been done before in the sense that we're releasing the data straight away and we're allowing anyone from across the globe to look at it and actually submit uh, ideas and designs for new compounds. Another part of the virus machine that researchers have been targeting for vaccine development is the spike protein. This is the component of the virus that allows it to attach to and invade human cells. Where does your research and the work being done at the synchrotron fit into the overall picture of providing us with a vaccine one day? Uh, so if we look at, for example, the spike protein, the one that does the infection, if we expose the part that also binds to the human cell, and if the immune response, for example, uh, is exactly to the shape that is the same shape that binds, you know, that key, a key in, finds a lock in the human cell to connect, then if the virus gets rid of that portion of the spike protein, it will also not infect us because that's the part that is crucial. So this is an example where structure-based design of vaccine is important. For understanding the machine, we can work on a drug to help current the situation because the vaccine is a medium to long term, the drug will be a shorter term. So by getting the structure of this, we are working on both fronts. It's a disease that could attack anybody. Life under lockdown. I don't rattle path out. It comes Madrid, as a shock to all of us. So I'm in home isolation. I'm Isabel Ewing in Budapest. We have a simple message for all countries. Test, test, test. After schools shut their gates from Friday. We are accelerating research. I said very clearly there's more to do. Develop a vaccine. You were the oldest person to have survived this nasty virus. Thank you so much for all you people. Don't forget you can sign up to our daily newsletter. We bring you all the top business headlines straight to your inbox. So sign up for free at this address. CGTN. See the difference. How will your world change today? What happens here? What happens there? Or what you make happen for yourself? If it matters to you, it matters to us too. Your stories are the stories that need to be told. Africa Live. Find your voice. The repurposing of drugs or treatments originally used to treat other diseases is common in medicine, and it's happening even more now. Razor's Joe Colan came across an example of this when researchers working to find a universal antivenom to snake bite received an unexpected phone call from the International AIDS Vaccine Initiative. Everything changed for Professor Rob Harrison when he got a call from the International AIDS Vaccine Initiative in San Diego. The telephone call was, do you want to collaborate with us? 
And my immediate reaction... Not on HIV, but on snake well, exactly. bite. Exactly, that was my reaction. Why, why, why HIV? And he, was, he explained very quickly um, was that they had technical platforms that they had developed for their HIV vaccine research that he thought we could use very usefully for snake bite. Up until now, treatment has been based on the venom, not on the symptoms it causes, which include paralysis, asphyxiation, and unstoppable bleeding and bleeding in the brain. So the people who've been working on AIDS have understood more about the molecules and more about the antibodies and how they can work to interact broadly with HIV viruses, despite them changing a lot over time. The HIV researchers found that some humans develop broadly neutralising antibodies that prevent infection by the majority of HIV strains. Remarkably, these antibodies have found parts of the virus protein that are common among the many different strains. Such antibodies are therefore capable of inhibiting infection by any virus that has that region in common. In some cases, this translates to almost 90% inhibition of diverse HIV strains by a single antibody. What we're hoping to be able to do is to engineer antibodies so that they can broadly recognise lots of these different toxins, no matter which snake bites a person, and so they can be neutralised in a generic manner. The man from the International AIDS Vaccine Initiative who made that original call to the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine was Dr Devin Sock. So we thought we'd call him to see if his research into the parallels between snake bite and HIV might apply to coronavirus. We've tried to develop platforms and tools and approaches to try and deal with that level of diversity, and that has a parallel challenge in the area of snake bite. So snake bite, there's so many different types of snakes, they have so many different types of venom. How do you create a universal product to treat against all of snake, um, all the different species of snake all over the world? And so we are identifying parallels in terms of the variability challenge from a scientific point of view, and how do you come up with the tools or discover the antibodies that can be broadly effective? Um, so for the two hardest problems, HIV and snake bite, it was somewhat of a no-brainer to try and apply these tools to something like coronavirus. I think in the immediate, we know that this virus that's circulating around the world, it's, it's mutating, but not at a rate that is, you know, parallels HIV. It's, it's pretty static, relatively speaking. So we think that we can find effective antibodies against this current pandemic to really help with the situation. I think we're also thinking about it long term. So can we identify antibodies that can treat and prevent the entire coronavirus family so that we're not only developing products that can treat and prevent the current pandemic, but any future pandemic that it might emerge from the related family. So a lot of the same principles that we're applying uh, to these different diseases. And so where are you with your research now? We are working around the clock amidst this uh, chaos <laughs> and this shutdown. So we made a lot of progress in a very short amount of time. And so we've been able to um, identify some pretty good donors who have clearly strong neutralizing antibody responses. So antibodies that we think have a lot of therapeutic uh, value, and we are in the process of isolating antibodies from those individuals. Uh, and we're hoping to move very quickly on this soon. There's a lot of people working on this, and I'm pretty confident that with the combined brilliance of the world, we're going to get to a vaccine and get to an antibody fairly quickly. What we IAVI are really focused on and what we really care about is making sure that whatever gets developed, an antibody, a vaccine, that it gets, that it's accessible to everyone around the world. Um, so not just focus on high income markets, but inevitably this virus being a global pandemic is gonna hit areas that are more resource limited where there's no such thing as social distancing because people live in such close proximity where there's no running water to wash your hands. In these communities, people are really vulnerable. Um, there's all the inequality that existed previously are going to be highlighted even further. And that's a different challenge. It's not just a scientific challenge, it's also a public health challenge. It's a scalability challenge, it's an affordability challenge. These are challenges that really 
um, we haven't had to face before. Um, and so that's really what we're trying to focus on long term. It's an impossible dream to fly by yourself, right? But Shinny Samara met an inventor who has achieved that dream by building a personal jetpack. Richard Browning constantly reworks and develops his jet suit using 3D printing. But now he's using that capacity to make protective masks for his local hospital. Hi Richard, I can see there's a 3D printer printing away furiously in the background there. Yeah, yeah, we've been, uh, we've been keeping it busy actually, doing these things. Um, these are these headbands for the, uh, grab one here, for the, for the face visors. There's a, there's a completed face visor. And we've been printing the headbands and the little chin pieces here to make these. So uh, yeah, but anyway, we've been uh, having great fun um, trying to do our best to support the local uh, medical community with these visors. How easy has it been to design these masks? There's a variety of designs out there. Uh, some of them do look quite flimsy. We chose one that's designed not to be disposable. It's designed to be one that you clean and reuse because I, th I think part of the challenge has been the amount of disposable PPE, personal protective equipment, that then gets thrown away. And, and guess what? You get through it really quickly. We built slightly on one of the designs available online. There's clever things uh, that weren't really down to us. Uh, where these little nobbles here, which accept the, um, uh, the acetate visor material, are the right spacing for a standard hole punch. Um, so if you take a normal hole punch and then you hole punch the, uh, the visor material, then the holes are pretty much exactly the right size. So, you know, what a great idea. That wasn't our idea. Uh, what a great idea to help, you know, speed up the uh, manufacture process. Beyond that, um, because these are a physical protection, I should get one, let me grab this one again. Uh, because these are a physical protection between you and the patient you're dealing with to help stop you transmitting something to them and vice versa, you can assess its effectiveness fairly reasonably by looking at it. We would stray away from trying to produce anything more clever like a, an actual respirator mask or anything because a lot of its effectiveness is hidden away in the design of the filter and all that sort of stuff. You know, this is as good as as big as you make it and yet you want it to allow some freedom of movement and not have it too heavy as well. So uh, they are pretty simple, really. I mean, it's like a super tiny welding mask in a way. It's really just down to efficient design and you can pretty much create anything in the home, theoretically. Uh, well, certainly out of plastic, yes. Uh, and, and, and when you mention design, actually, th th there's an interesting point here that is often lost on people, I think, because additive manufacture is such a new thing, you actually have to design fairly sympathetically for it. So there's little things like those nobbles I mentioned, if I can point to them here, those nobbles I mentioned that actually punch through the holes you cut in the, in the clear stuff here, um, if you notice, they're sitting at one end of the design there, they're sitting towards the base here. That's because when you print it, it's built up with layer upon layer upon layer of plastic. If you tried to build it that way, well, you've got an overhang. So when the nozzle gets to that layer, it's gonna start building a little overhang. To an extent it can do that, but because it's squirting out hot plastic, it'll just droop eventually. So you have to introduce in the design something called support, which is a little like pillar structure underneath anything that's overhanging. Now, if you did that, that's gonna slow the printer down a little bit. And also it's gonna be a bit of messing around to clean that off afterwards. It's a very simple example, but if you can design sympathetically to the process, you'll speed it up. So if you notice this thing doesn't need any support at all. So you've delivered 30 to the local hospital. How have they been received by the doctors? Yeah, we took some along uh, earlier this week and uh, yeah, they loved them. They actually said that they were very similar, if not more comfortable than the ones that they typically wear. We've got them being reviewed at the moment uh, for like frontline care with their procurement and infection control team. Uh, there is a challenge where it's so much easier if you've got disposable ones, because even if they're half decent, you can, you can create some degree of separation and then throw it away afterwards and you don't have the challenge of sterilization afterwards. Um, so the fact that we're aiming for these to be reusable and cleaned in between use does create a bit of a challenge, uh, but they really like them. And there's a couple of little tweaks we're gonna make for the frontline use, but in the meantime, the GP uh, usage, um, I, I mean, they're, they're loving them and they're, they're, they're in great demand. That's it for this edition of Razor. Stay safe, take care of each other, and we'll see you again next week.